Góralska, and I was born in Poland um, in a Catholic family where I think my mum had a leading role as somebody who was, um, who was um, a religious person. Um, and she was, she was always behind all you know, religious festivals. Uh, my father wasn't really strict about it, but it was, yeah, it was my mom uh, who was always cared about um, Christmas, Easter, you know, going to church. Uh, there was no much excuse not to go to church. It was, you know, Sunday coming, we are going to church. Uh, and I think it was deeply because it was more tradition that was passed from generation to generation. As she said, you know, her grandparents to her parents, her parents to her, and obviously she was doing her duty to, you know, to pass knowledge and things to me. Um, and I think um, at that moment I didn't question anything. I was a child and, and I had a, you know, happy childhood. Um, my parents really, you know, did a good job, you know, uh, giving me a lovely childhood, happiness. Um, so, uh, yeah, these all moments, uh, festivals, you know, gathering uh, with families, all bring good memories. And as any other child in Poland, I was Christianed. Then I had my first uh, Holy Communion, then Confirmation, as you call it. And, and yes, I, I have to admit that I was involved uh, in, in the religious side of, of, of my life. I mean, uh, probably I didn't understand many things because I was just a child. But uh, yeah, I, I was in a choir, you know, chapel, ch ch chapel, qu chapel choir. And uh, uh, when we had a uh, Holy Communion, uh, I was chosen to read Bible. Also, I was singing. Uh, and I enjoyed it, yes. Um, and I think uh, only when I was in my teenage years, I started thinking about, about all aspects of religion, why and how, because um, even during these festivals, I don't remember, um, there was this, um, uh, there was this site um, of, 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 of uh, our practice where we would sit and read a Bible or we, you know, in terms of quest questions like why we do it or, or uh, where it comes from. Or what is the point? Why are we celebrating Christmas? And why do we celebrate uh, Easter? It was just, you know, uh, natural. We we do it because we do it. And and yes, and I think only when I was um, teenager, I started to think deeper and deeper. I mean, uh, still, it was, you know, it was just 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 a part of my life. Uh, but, uh, but yes, I, I I think I was always close to God, and and I and I talked, you know, talked to him. And, uh, and I like to pray. Obviously, as a child, I, I don't remember, you know, um, that I enjoyed, truly enjoyed going to church and being there for one hour and, you know, listening all, all what was said. Um, so, um, so only in, I think, in high school, I, I remember I used to pray because I, I felt like praying. And then also I said I would like to go to church, not because I have to go, but I just have this need. And I would say, you know, I don't feel like going this Sunday because we have to, you know, I prefer to stay at home, but I still have connection with God and I still have my relation. And, and you know, I can go Wednesday, Tuesday. Uh, and I remember I, I enjoyed, you know, going to an empty church, you know, being there for a while, you know, just, just contemplate. Um, and then when I finished high school in my in my town when I was uh, uh, when I was growing up I moved to Warsaw uh, I think that was my first encounter with uh, with Islam because uh, during the curriculum we had um, we had uh, subject uh, world's religions so we had to cover Islam as well uh, but obviously with you know with uh, with with the negative picture of Islam as it's you know presented in Poland by media uh, I just probably my attitude was like okay we have to cover that you know this is my part of you know uh, of education I have to do it I have to pass exams I have to get the knowledge and that's it it was probably like you know a sponge I soaked it and then you know everything evaporated or you know just 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 leaked yeah, I am the only one child um, so I don't know you can call it privileged or but uh, 
but I think uh, at some point I, I wanted to have a company, you know, to play with somebody. But, um, but uh, I, I remember that um, my parents always, uh, always found time, you know, for, for me when I, when I w wanted to spend more time with somebody or play. I had, uh, I had other children around, neighbors, children. We, we used to live in a, uh, in a block of flats, so plenty of children to play with. Uh, so I, I couldn't complain at that time. And um, uh, I remember, you know, week was week, obviously, you know, school and, and, and my parents to, to were going to work, uh, but weekends we spent together. So we were going to a Lake District, to my grandparents, uh, and I had a lovely time. We used to gather with family. Uh, yeah, I have uh, lovely memories. Um, I, I, uh, we, we spent much time together. Um, and when summer holidays came, I would be sent probably to my grandparents from you know one site or to another. So then again, uh, when I was going to my my uh, father's family, my grandparents, um, now I I think I appreciate that a lot because my grandmother used to focus on you know on good behavior on you know morals. Or you know, hard work, and I was involved in many things. You know, uh, um, harvesting, you know, gathering crops because they lived in a countryside. And I think, from from, from my point of view now, I really appreciate because at that time it was a hard job, but we enjoyed it as kids. You know, kids would gather, you know, play in the fields, in in forests. We could you know find many ideas uh, what to do and how to spend our time. And then again, when I was going to my um, my mum's uh, parents, my grandparents, um, uh, there was much to do as well. Um, so, um, so yeah, and um, and I think I didn't mention that I was uh, attending a public primary school. It wasn't uh, a religious school like a Catholic school. It was just just a normal um, uh, school. When from early years, I think we had religious uh, education as well. Um, so yeah, so. So uh, it was a nice time. I think as a child, because you know, at that time I was still a child. I don't remember much, but I think uh, uh, from from my experience, from my memories, it, we, you know, uh, it was always a, uh, there was always a focus on religion, you know, in our society, uh, you know, church and, and festivals and what you you know should do or what you you, you shouldn't be doing, and. And I think, and I was always thinking that maybe it's just because of the um, tradition, you know, deep tradition, you know, that uh, was passed through generation. Not really, not really, you know, religious, pure, you know, pure aspect of it, but just, you know, tradition. And um, I don't remember really, you know, um, as a child, I don't remember, you know, if that was the reason because we were, uh, you know, suppressed or oppressed. But I think, um, uh, that's that's the reason why I think until today uh, society, our society is probably not open to to you know to new religions and to new new nations new you know new new ways of doing things or you know beliefs and I think that's 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 the that's the main reason why why still until now people you know are are probably afraid of you know uh, uh, increasing their knowledge or just asking questions or or just uh, um, pondering over why is it like that and you know against what everything is being said in TV, you know, just, just to ask yourself, is that true, is that right, you know, what they, what they say about Islam, for example, it is, you know, um, so, uh, yeah. At one side was, you know, something exciting, you know, I was going to a new location and I was about to start, a, you know, a new part of my life. And at the other, because I was always um, very close to my mother, we had a very close, tight relation, uh, so I think um, I just put a brave face, you know, <laughs> and I just went ahead. Um, it wasn't easy, you know, new place, new people, new responsibilities. Um, um, I guess you would have to um, fit in some ways, you know, of the new environment and new style of life. Uh, but that was the time when um, at the same, at the same time, I had, uh, I had my freedom. I mean, I could, you know, I could, I could go further, and I could, you know, I could expand my territory. But at the same time, I learned a lot, and that gave me so much to think about life 
and um, so it was a mixture of everything. I think, yeah, yeah, and I think uh, you have to find a way of um, of finding yourself. Then you have to, you have to just just carry on. Um, but as I said, that was the first time when when um, when I um, when I learned about Islam, and I also had uh, other people in my school that were, you know, uh, close friends of, of Muslims as well. And because we had um, uh, wars of religions, um, I remember part of our education was uh, where lectures were, Muslims were invited and we could basically listen to their stories. We could ask questions, we had our notebooks. You know, we had to prepare our, you know, notes and 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 our reflections, uh, and I think that was nice. But still, again, it was something new. I, I had to learn about it. It was really nice to to get to know other cultures, other religions. But I think it didn't change anything at that time. You know, it was just okay. I was studying there. I spent um, almost five years, and I never planned to come to London. It's uh, it never, you know, uh, it was never my plan to come here anyway. It wasn't the place of my interest. Um, uh, but uh, I think it's because I met uh, my husband. And, you know, that's something that, you know, uh, that was the reason, main reason why I'm here now. Uh, I guess, you know, you can't plan many things in your life. It just happens as it happens. Okay, I came to London because of my husband mainly. Um, um, we met in Slovakia and I think, you know, the things, you know, just happened as it happened. And as I said, I never planned to come to London, but it's, you know, uh, when you meet somebody and, you know, it's, uh, you, you can't control some, you know, things in your life. Uh, when I came to London, um, I mean, as I said, I, I didn't plan to be here, to live here. Uh, it was, it was, it was different life. <clears throat> And, well, you know, it dawned on me when, you know, our responsibilities of, of, of you know, of a couple, you know, uh, came together, you no know, family, and uh, um, you are not, you know, you are not a student anymore, you, you, you don't have, you know, you, you are not there, you, you can't do things as you used to do. Um, but then, again, now I think it was a way of blessing for me. Um, uh, there are some things that... Um, I've written there, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows exactly, you know, what, what your life is going to look like. And I think uh, that that was just simply meant to happen. Um, and it wasn't easy, of course, because um, first of all, he's an Arab and he's a Muslim. And people are still in Poland, they are still not tolerant, they are not open. You know, it's fine as long as, long, you know, as long as, as you know, as okay, you know, why didn't you choose somebody, you know, from Poland? Why, why not, you know, why, why? Uh, but I say, you can't, you can't happen. You, you, just, you just can't plan things, it, it happens. And, um, and I think that was the first kind of a barrier. They, my family, my parents, they have to go through, you know, to, to accept my husband, uh, the way he is, you know, where he's from, you know, uh, he's a Muslim. And, and I remember that, uh, my parents at that time weren't really worried that I might become a, a Muslim because I myself with all we've been fed with, you know, through medias and all information and everything that has been said about Islam in mostly negative way. I remember myself thinking and saying in my head, no way, never, ever, you know, never. That is not an option. Uh, but then when I heard, you know, people saying, they say, but you know, you are, he's Muslim, you are Christian, you know. Uh, there are some things you have to compromise probably on. You have to somehow, you know, come to an agreement because obviously he being a Muslim, he's eating halal. Yeah. You are not. Uh, they don't drink alcohol and you might, you know, you might want. Um, so because I'm an easygoing person, um, I. I think I said, okay, yes, it's not a problem, you know, I don't have to bring alcohol home. Uh, um, you know, there are halal batches everywhere around, I will, you know, buy, we'll eat. Um, but then when I was going to Poland for summer holidays, obviously, you know, I, I continued the way I, I used to live. Um, um, and yes, it's been 
it's been eight years. It took me eight years to slowly, slowly uh, get to know Islam and to start being interested in this religion. And uh, of course, you know, there was a Quran at home, um, which was there and, you know, I never probably bothered looking inside. It was there because it was there. Um, but I think being in London and um, it's a, such a mixture of you know, cultures and, and, and religions. Uh, uh, many times I came across Muslims and they wanted to talk to me and I asked questions and, you know, and friends of my husband um, as well. So I remember the first time when I started thinking, oh, it would be nice to go to mosque to see how it is. You know, I've never been there. And I knew uh, that when I was studying in Warsaw, uh, there was an Islamic center. And some of my friends uh, who were studying, um, uh, I think, uh, uh, at the Warsaw University, they were going there because they, they had to cover, you know, religious as well. Um, so, so yes, I thought it would be nice. But I think it was always, you know, it, it was always uh, my intention and it, you know, always ended up with just intention. And then having, you know, kids and, and busy life and all other responsibilities. Um, and I remember my husband uh, would go and buy books and would bring them and would bring some DVDs, CDs. But I think it was just, just, you know, it was just that. I would never probably look in the books. I would never, you know, have an intention to watch DVD because I was busy with the other things. Um, but I think slowly, slowly, and one more thing which is amazing when I, when I think about it now is when my husband would play Quran in his car at home, um, I wouldn't stand it at the beginning. It was just annoying for me. I, I couldn't listen to it. The, 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 I didn't understand. Firstly, I didn't understand it. And the way it was recited, it annoyed me, truly annoyed me. And I always said, please, if you want to listen, just, just you know, volume down because I, I, I don't want to listen to it. But, uh, mashallah, through, you know, through, through all these times when he played a Quran, you know, I was, you know, please calm it down, you know, volume down. I, I don't want it. He, he would, you know, persevere. And, and finally, I, I, I didn't mind anymore. I, it felt amazing, actually. It felt amazing. It was so, you know, I felt such a serenity and, you know, such a, you know, peace in me to the point that I would fall asleep, really. So it was amazing. And I think, um, and I think that's, that's, that's when I knew that something is, you know, changing and happening. It was a new, it was a new chapter in my life. And, and you just can't prepare yourself for that because, because it's something, you know, unknown. You have to just go there and, you know, start and, 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 and see and feel how it is. And obviously my mom would, you know, would say, you know, have a rest because you know because then when you become a mother you have to forget about yourself completely you know the children will come first and it's going to be hard it's it's the hardest job in the whole world being a mother um uh yes and i think that period of my time showed me how much my mom did to me you know how much she gave me and and what she did to me and and how much i owe her and now even from from my point of view as being um, Muslim, uh, I know that I won't be able to repay her, you know, even, even a percent of what she did. Uh, so, I know, so I know that, you know, it is important. And obviously Islam says that, you know, there's a paradise, you know, at, at your mother's um, feet. Um, so, yes, and it's hard. It's hard when, it's, it's hard when you want to um, probably join all the things together, being, you know, working and, and being a mom and, and doing other things. So I think because woman naturally knows how to look after the, the kids, I think it's, it's a good place for her to be, you know, to be there for children and to be for family. Because when you compromise and you split things, uh, things start to, you know, slip and go astray. And, uh, and I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's important to be there for your kids all the time. Um, uh, my mom, you know, she didn't have a choice. She had to work, and 
and she she had to work and she had to, you know she had to cook and she had to clean and she look, had to look after me and she still had to find a time you know to be with me and and it's amazing you know that she did all of that and and uh, and yes and uh, and now i know um how special she is to me um um so yes but still again um it is not easy and i think uh, when i became a uh, muslim i i started with reading about the role of woman in islam position as a as a woman as a as a as a daughter as a as 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 a wife uh and and that helps a lot uh, because i know what is my role i know what i can do i know how far i can go and and it teaches me the islam teaches me how to de deal with you know with with the daily life with 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 daily problems um it's it asks me to be um uh, patient to be you know wise to treat my children the way they deserve to be treated you know to be understanding and to uh, to show them how you know how to live and how to grow up because even before converting i always wanted my daughters to grow up as you know as a um, decent as respected you know uh um uh wise woman i always wanted uh, that for them i think at that time i didn't really think about it uh uh okay they have muslim names but i'm still here you know i'm christian and um and at that time i apart from the fact that i wanted to you know to to know the way to know morals to know you know what is good what is right and what is wrong and how to treat other people i still thought that you know why not they have to be you know liberated they have to you know know the life you know life and and they have to you know go through what i went through but now i think there are some aspects that they they don't really you know they don't have to go through because life you know being a muslim life is is beautiful as it is without you know all the things that are there you know offered to to people around um so uh so yes so at that time i didn't think and um maybe i had some worries that uh, oh my husband is muslim and uh, and listen to other you know mothers muslim mothers um uh he will you know eventually he will he will do anything for them to be muslims but now i know why because because this is the way this is the way now obviously i don't see any other way i want them to be muslims because you know because uh because i think islam uh, is the religion that if you really embrace it i think it can bring the best out of you so i don't know i think i i i had you know i had the role of the woman in my head was was the role that you probably come across in you know and western societies i'm not saying it's it's bad you know everything every aspects of that is bad because obviously uh they're fantastic women you know whether they are muslims or not uh but for me you know being liberated before i converted meant you know um you go go and study you know have fun uh, uh uh be as any other teenager still you know knowing your you know your role uh and your position in your life still you know maintaining you know uh everything uh, uh basically having you know moral standards you know knowing what is good what is right i mean uh i was always sensitive person and um and i think i i was always um uh a person who who likes to see justice i didn't like people treating other people you know uh in a bad way or or i didn't like uh, kids at school bullying other kids i always had this you know this this in my heart this is not right this is not how it is you should you know you should treat people with respect and and uh and good these should be you know rewarded but these should be should be punished so i had i think i have this you know i have this role in my head you know what and how but still at that time i think islam for me and the woman you know in islam she was for me oppressed you know basically due to you know lack of knowledge because i didn't know how it is and what it is uh only when i 
started studying about women in Islam. Only then, you know, my eyes opened, and I said, "Listen, I, 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 I told myself, myself, listen, it's, it's, it's not how how we see it. It's not how you know what we what we hear about. Everything that is presented in Poland, uh, it's majority majority of." you know, of programs and news and things about Islam is, is negative. Uh, only now, slowly and slowly, because of, you know, bigger number of Muslims growing in Poland, only, only now you have, you know, uh, positive messages coming in. But at that time, everything was like negative. No woman is, is oppressed. You have no rights. You can't go. You can't do anything. You can't work. You just have to sit at home doing nothing. What, what is, you know, what is this life? This is not the life you, you would like to have. And when I studied about, about women in Islam, it's, it's op it opened my eyes completely. It's not like that. I mean, you still can go and study, you still can work, you still can do many things, you know, being a photographer, you know, having your, your passion, as long as you keep in, in boundaries, obviously. Something with me, um, one of the stories about um, Sayyida Fatima Zahra alayhi salam um, to share with others to show um, uh, what a good example they were to follow and to look up to um, and I think it's a it's a good thing to research and to read stories and biographies of of uh, people of Ahul Bayt to to have a general idea the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam has said, Fatima is part of me, whoever harms her, harms me. He has also said, Fatima is part of me, whoever disappoints her, disappoints me. In these traditions, the statement that Fatima is part of me has an in-depth meaning. It shows that Fatima alayhi salam is not only the daughter of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, no wonder that where the Holy Prophet declared Fatima as part of himself, he also announced, Verily, my daughter Fatima is the leader of the women of the world. Say the Fatima, alayhi salam, by virtue of being Bid'atul Rasul, part of the Holy Prophet, and Saidatun Nisail Alamin, leader of the women of the world, is an excellent role model, particularly for the Muslim woman. With regard to knowledge, Islam teaches us three things, learn, apply, and teach others. In the life of Sayyidah Fatima salam, we find that she gave importance to all these three stages of knowledge. One day the Holy Prophet wasalam, came to the house of his beloved daughter. She salam, asked him a number of questions on religious rights. Among them was a question regarding a wife's duty towards her husband. One of the many things that the Holy Prophet told her was, O Fatima, a woman who demands things which are outside the means of her husband is removed from the pale of divine grace. After her marriage to Ali, alayhi salam, we will find that Sayyidah Fatima, alayhi salam, never asked or demanded anything from her husband, lest he cannot afford and is embarrassed to say so. One day Imam Ali, Alayhi salam insisted that his wife ask him for something. After much insistence, she alayhi salam, agreed and asked for a pomegranate. As Imam Ali bought one from the market and was walking towards home, his eyes fell upon a poor man who was ill. He asked the man what he wanted and the man expressed his desire to eat pomegranate. Without hesitation, Imam alayhi salam, gave away the pomegranate he had bought for his wife. Now, as he walked towards his home, Imam felt guilty and thought that this was the first time ever Fatima alayhi salam, had asked for a pomegranate and I have been unable to fulfill her wish. Although he was certain that Fatima would be happy to know that the pomegranate was given away in a good cause, nevertheless, he still felt guilty. Meanwhile, Jibril came to the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, with a tray of pomegranates from the paradise and informed him as to what happened. The Holy Prophet gave the tray to Salman and asked him to deliver it to Fatima before Ali reached home. Fatima alayhi salam asked, O oh Salman, where has this tray come from? Salman said, O oh daughter of the Prophet, 
you express your desire for a pomegranate from Ali. He bought it and gave it to poor beggar. For his sincere action, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent this tray from the paradise so that you wish your wish is fulfilled and Ali is also saved from any embarrassment. Imam Ali arrived home with his head down due to guilt. As soon as he entered, he said, Oh Fatima, what is the smell of pomegranates I feel? She said, Oh Ali, these pomegranates are what you sent. You gave away one to a beggar, and in return, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent them from paradise. This is what I call learning and applying knowledge. And this is what I personally uh, call a perfect example, how to apply all teachings and duties we, we as a Muslims. Yes, I think it was the time when I was studying in Warsaw when I noticed uh, this trend. So, uh, uh, basically, girls trying to be, apart from gaining knowledge, trying to be attractive. And you know, and the pressure on girls and women, especially in bigger cities, you know, uh, children coming from all around the, the, the country, they get into the Warsaw, they get into Warsaw, they get into, you know, capitals or whatever, big cities, either it's Poland or, or, or another country, and they see this, you know, way of life, you know, you have to be this and you have to be that. And I think at that point I saw, I saw, you know, the pressure on girls and women, you have to look good, you know, to get a job. You have to look good to get this. You have to look good to go through. It's all about look, you know, these days. And I was asking, what about, you know, all people who, I mean, uh, we should look the way we look because we were created that way and we should appreciate the way we look, you know, we are. So what the point of, you know, forcing yourself into something that you don't necessarily find yourself comfortable with, but just for the sake of, you know, just for the sake of because everyone else is doing this. So I thought, well, it's, I think it's too much, you know, to, to, to be somebody else, not yourself, because this is how it is. And, uh, and I was thinking, yes, what about, you know, what about my experience? What about my knowledge? What about other skills that doesn't count anymore? I still have to, apart from them, I still have to look good and, you know, be attractive. And I think that was the, that was the, you know, something that struck me when I, when I was uh, doing research about women in Islam, that uh, that uh, what should be attractive about women is her her personality, her, her her you know herself, her knowledge, her skills, not the way she she looks like, uh, not the way she dresses. It's just you know all the beauty comes from inside, and the beauty from inside makes you beautiful, the way you are. And I think that's 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 something that uh, that I would call liberated because I don't have to be somebody else. I don't have to, you know, put tons of makeup or you know have to go spend hours in shops to you know uh, uh, lunch through you know racks with different clothes and thinking uh, what I should be you know wearing today. What you know how I look like you know or maybe this is not wrong. This is this is not right. Uh, so I think uh, yes, I can focus. On myself, basically, you know, I can, I can be myself, and I, I, I can appreciate myself the way I am. Now, when I think about um, my husband and and uh, and why I converted, um, I think it's amazing how how patient he was because he never he never put a pressure on me, never. Um, yes, he would bring books, he would bring movies and CDs, and sometimes he would talk with me about some issues uh, but uh, but he never no I never felt pressure and when I converted uh, I did it I did it for for myself it was my decision 100% and now when I think about his patience may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him for for all efforts he did throughout all these years and 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 um, and uh, perseverance he, he had, I mean, just, just waiting, uh, waiting and being patient. And when I converted, I, I did it myself. I woke up one morning and after researching and uh, I was thinking that the, the day before in the evening, I was thinking whether to do it or not to do it. 
But then I woke up in the morning and I said, well, if, if something happens to me the, the next day or even today and I die, uh, I would really like to die a Muslim because it's, it's, it's some, it's, you, you start your life anew. It, you, it's like being born. It's like starting afresh um, with a blank card. And then you can try, you can learn and you can try to do your best. You know, so you have good deeds recorded. Try to avoid bad things. Uh, follow uh, follow uh, teachings of Islam. And I woke up that morning and I said, yes, um, I will do it today. I was on my own with with uh, with my daughters. Uh, I said shahada and um, and yes, and I became a Muslim. And I was so happy. The feeling was amazing. It was it was it was. I felt like I could carry mountains from place to place. It, it's it's something uh, probably you can't describe. You just can feel. Uh, so yeah, I I didn't have any pressure on me whatsoever, and I did it because I wanted. I was you know with a full awareness. Uh, I think also what was really nice um, and very interesting and maybe not only for people who are interested in becoming a Muslim is the science in Quran. I mean, um, I, I couldn't believe all the facts uh, you can find actually in Quran and all science, including biology, including botany, uh, geography, and, uh, and uh, astronomy, you can all, fi you can all find it in, uh, in Quran. And it's amazing because all these facts, all this information were actually discovered recently uh, with, you know, with months, if not years of research using modern technology that wasn't available at, at the time when Quran was sent. So I think it's another it's another thing that I think takes you aback and you know and uh, and shows you that that yeah it's it, it has to be a through word from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So when I started my research um, about Islam, um, it was just general questions I had, and whenever I went um, to website and I, I grabbed the book. Um, I mean, uh, I didn't come across anything like there are, you know, certain paths or certain schools of thought that, you know, I have to choose. So basically I thought, okay, I'm becoming Muslim and I am Muslim and that's it. Uh, so I didn't have anything in my mind, you know, who to follow or, you know, who to look up to. And my husband asked me what path do I want to walk? What school of thought do, you want, do I want to choose? And I didn't have an idea of what he's talking about. And then he, he told me about schools of Toth. You know, there is a Sunni path, there is a Shia path, there is, you know, Ahul Bayt school. And, and what was really nice about him as well, that he said, listen, it's, it's your choice. You decided to become a Muslim and it's your choice what school of Toth you are choosing. But as long as it makes sense to you and as long as you follow what, what what feels logical to you, not you follow because other follow, and not you follow the school because this is the, 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 you know, the popular one or it's majority. You choose what you feel in your heart is right. So, uh, so I started reading more and more. I started comparing and, and yes, and I chose Ahlul Bayt School of Tov because, uh, because it makes sense for me and, uh, and then coming to um, hadith as well, where Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sallam says um, that um, I'm leaving you two weighty things, which is hadith of two weighty things. I'm leaving behind me, I'm leaving two weighty things. And if you adhere to them, you will not go astray. So, which is Quran and an Ahl Bayt. The household of Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sallam, uh, and yeah, and most of the versions I came across, they 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 translate as Quran and Ahlul Bayt, and I think only one says uh, translates as Sunnah. But still, I mean, doing research and reading and you know using your logic, it's still okay. We can call it Sunnah because actually Ahlul Bayt, with all their life and you know. Uh, the, the way of living and style of living and you know and being so selfless and 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 so amazing and so beautiful in sense you know to preserve the true message of Islam they are they are actually Sunnah 
there are you know people who I I think I should look up you know look up to. Uh, so yeah, so I and you know and the more I read uh, because there's you know um, the more I read I find myself you know uh, knowing less. So I guess it's you know it's a long um, lifelong uh, process you know to 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 increase your knowledge and probably you know when we die we will still you know lack of you know of 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 many things. But I think the more I learn, the more I'm convinced that I'm walking, you know, the right path. And uh, and um, and yes, that's 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 that was my choice. After reading the story about teaching others and the example of Saida Fatima Al Zahra Al Salam, I thought it would be nice to say a big thank you and Jazakallah her to one of the sisters who who helped me a lot. Uh, um Hassan, thank you so much for guiding me. And as uh, uh, Fatima Al Zahra. Uh, answering all my questions, whether small or stupid or, or difficult or not, whether, whether, whether uh, making sense or not for being for me always there and, and guiding me and supporting. Thank you again. Uh, if I had to convert again, if I would go back again to this point in time, I think I would do it again. I wouldn't even hesitate. Um, obviously, there are many changes and you have to, you have to change your lifestyle that comes with it. Um, but what my advice is to take things slowly, not to rush. I think many of us, when we convert, I think we want, you know, from one, from day one, we want to be, you know, good. We want to do the best, you know, the way possible. We want to know everything. And I think it's, it's not like that. I think the slowly, the better, because we, the, the, the way we, we take it, we can both learn and appreciate it. But if we hurry up, uh, I think, we might find ourselves, you know, it's too fast, it's too much, you know, this is not the way I expected, this is not what I wanted. Uh, obviously there are some changes and, and, um, and sometimes I think, oh, it would be better if I converted uh, before my daughters were born, but I think this is, you know, this is how, how it meant to be. I think now um, uh, them knowing, you know, both kind of lifestyles, they will have this, I think, uh, um, plus to to compare and to choose you know maybe not now because they are children but then they will go back and they will you know see things and they will able they will be able to compare things you know we saw that we, we took part in that and you know that that was the lifestyle and this is the lifestyle and you know we we, we know what we are talking about um, uh, after I converted in July um, I decided I will go to Poland for Christmas because my mom didn't want to talk to me over telephone and I felt really heartbroken. I mean, she was very, we were very close, always very close. And she helped me a lot. She, she's, she's an amazing woman. And um, I decided I would go, you know, um, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the strength I have, you know, with the, with the confidence, you know, with the positive attitude, I will go. And, and I went and it was, I think, the hardest thing I've done in my life. I think it was so, Hard. Now when I when I come back when I think about it I sometimes I ask myself how did I do this how you know how how I managed to do it because when I was going uh, I was going in hijab the day I converted I put hijab on I mean scarf and obviously hijab you know the way I thought at that time was you know was was uh, was um, uh, was comfortable for me the clothes I put that was my hijab and uh, and then. When I was going to Poland in December for Christmas, I, I put the scarf and I put hijab and I said, yes, I'm going this way, you know, because that's what I've chosen and I'm not going to compromise. Um, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe it's, a, it's a harsh approach and some people, they, you know, may, may, may do it different way, you know, just to compromise, you know, take it slowly, you know, go to Poland, you know, just leave it behind, you know. Uh, I said, I will go, you know, I will go full ahead. Uh, so. Um, so I went, it wasn't easy. I mean, the, the eyes on you, you know, from people around, you know, uh, uh, this, this, this tension and this feeling, uh, and of course the reaction of my parents, it wasn't, you know, the nicest thing in the, in the world. Uh, but I think I wanted to show that, you know, this is my decision. I'm a grown up person and I know what I'm doing and nobody forced me regardless of what they think nobody falls me it's my decision and I'm the, on, the only thing that is changing is that I'm becoming better I'm trying to be better but a mother but a person you know uh, uh, yes because Islam Islam teaches us you know to 
to have respect to other people, you know, to regardless of the religion, regardless of, of you know, where they come from, of, you know, of uh, nationality, uh, you, you have to respect people. And even um, Imam Ali, alayhi salam, he said, you know, if, if, if somebody is not your brother or sister in faith, he's still your brother and, you know, in a, in a humanity. So you have to treat every, everybody the, the way you would like to be treated. So uh, there's so much beauty. Uh, so, you know, it comes, I think, converting and becoming a Muslim comes, you know, it brings everything all together. So after converting and becoming a Muslim, I see world differently and people differently. I, um, I always believed in, you know, in justice and, you know, good should be rewarded, bad should be punished. And, you know, these days in, in this world, it's, it's just, it's not as it should be, it's not happening. And, and that's another thing that, you know, Islam, Islam tells you that don't worry, because if you do good, you'll be rewarded for goodness. If you do bad, you'll be punished. So, so regardless of what's happening around you, uh, you should carry on with, with, with your way of living. And obviously you should, you should uh, encourage people to do good things and you should, you, you should uh, forbid bad things from happening. You know, I converted only two years ago. It's, it's little and I still research and I still read whenever I have time. But um, reading biographies of these people, amazing, you know, personalities, I think there is so much to learn from them. I, I feel without, you know, without anyone telling me how to feel. I feel so much respect to her, alayhi salam, and I feel so much love and uh, and I think she is a perfect of exa example of how to be a, uh, a Muslim woman, you know, at least try because I, I don't think I'll be ever, you know, able to reach her level, uh, but at least, you know, to learn and try and implement her teachings and her way uh, in my personal life. With regard to teaching others, Alama Muhammad Bakir al-Majlisi uh, has narrated in Bihar al-Anwar that one day a lady came to Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salam and said, I have an old weak mother who has some problems related to her salah prayers. She sent me to ask you some questions about them. Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salam asked her to put the questions to her. The number of questions one after another reached 10 and Saida answered all of them patiently. Eventually the lady said, O daughter of the Prophet, I do not wish to trouble you and put you to further inconvenience. Thereupon Saida Fatima salam, said, Come to me and ask me what you know not. Does a person who has been hired on wages of 1,000 dinars to carry a heavy thing from ground to rooftop ever feel tired? The woman said no. In other words, however tiring a work may be, if the reward is very good, one may not feel tedious and continue to work harder. Sayyidah Fatima salam, said, Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hired me and my wage for answering each question is equal to pearls filled between the earth and the sky. Therefore, it does not benefit me to exhibit any exhaustion. From this incident, we learn three things. One is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has charged Fatima alayhi salam by virtue of being bid'atu rasul, part of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, with the responsibility of guiding Muslim women and solving their problems. Two is that Muslim women have been encouraged to ask and learn what they know not of the Islamic laws. And three is that those women who have been blessed with knowledge must put efforts in imparting the same to other women.